talks about the importance of establishing a local church. He doesn't mean just starting a local church. He means to stabilize it and establish that local church so that it can do what uh, the Lord wants to be done through the local church because Jesus says it's his church. And Jesus would like the church run his way. And uh, you'll see there are four things that, that he does in the establishing of the local church here in chapter 3. He begins a wherefore, uh, talking about they were people he had led to the Lord in the second chapter. So wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it uh, good to be left at the Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and comfort you concerning your faith. And one of the things that God's always going to use in establishing a local church is ministers. Uh, he's going to have some ministers. Now here Paul went and now he's going to follow up with uh, Timothy, young Timothy, a, a brother, a, a minister. Ultimately, he says he's a minister of God. Uh, to minister is to serve someone, and a minister's real job is to serve. It's to uh, minister the Word of God and to serve the Word of God. And uh, what you're doing is you're serving someone, and ultimately who you're serving is God. And so Timothy is uh, serving God. Uh, his service, verse 2, is in the gospel of Christ. Uh, the, the purpose of the New Testament church is to reveal Christ to the world. And, and what Christ uh, wants to reveal to the world is good news, the gospel. In a world full of bad news, Christ wants to bring good news. So, so the local church that God is establishing is going to labor in the gospel going to be established to it says the word verse to establish you i want to set the foundation of christ i want to set the foundation that christ is preeminent uh, that should be the preaching uh in, in a church that should be the teaching ministry of a church uh even the prophecy and he's going to talk about prophecy in this book every chapter paul's going to mention prophecy but the prophecy will always center around christ and that's what prophecy should center around. The uh, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, it says in the book of Revelation. What does that mean? Does that mean every time Jesus talks, he's speaking prophetically? Well, in a manner of speaking, yes. Every time Jesus does talk, he has such a big picture that a spirit of prophecy is, is contained in his very words. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But also look at it like this. The right spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. If I'm going to have a prophecy conference, and I want the right spirit to be in that prophecy conference, we're going to talk about Jesus in that conference. Because all the plans that God has are in his Son. A prophecy conference is not going to be so much about the Middle East. If the Middle East is in it, it's because we're talking about Jesus' impact in the Middle East and what he plans to do with the Middle East. A prophecy conference isn't so much about the United States or about your future or mine. It's about what Jesus is going to do with the future because that's ultimately going to decide the future. God is very um, liberal in allowing us to do stuff. He allows us to run amok down here. But the testimony of Jesus is going to give you the right spirit of prophecy because you're going to understand what Jesus can finally do when he comes back. So, so this gospel is the gospel of Christ. That establishes the church. That comforts the church concerning your faith. Our faith is a Christ-centered faith. Bible-centered faith is Christ-centered faith. They go, they go hand in hand. It uh, grieves me sometimes to go to churches where there's so much activity and there's so little Jesus Christ and faith going on. So, so Paul says, you know, one of the ways we're going to get this done, one of the ways God is going to get this done, he's going to get men, men who are ministers, ministers who labor in the gospel of Christ. And those are the ones that really establish a church and really comfort the people and strengthen their, their faith. That's the first thing, first two things. going to use a man. 
And now why are we doing this? Verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. One of the things that Paul observed everywhere he went and began a work for God is there began to be trials and testing and persecution and affliction. Affliction comes with the ministry. Affliction comes with our faith. This is a faith that is going to be afflicted by unbelievers and the world. This is the faith once delivered to the saints. This is not a faith that we made up. This is not a faith based on our feelings. It's not based on our happiness or our comfort. It's not based on uh, some traditions we've received. Those faiths seem to do fine regarding each other. They seem to get along with each other for the most part. They can usually work things out. They can usually even tolerate each other. But there's one thing they can't tolerate is the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they're going to afflict. That they're going to fight. That they're going to kick against. Um, we are going to face afflictions as part of the ministry. Uh, and this is uh, one of the sad things that happens, but it's true. And so we need a man to establish and comfort us and prepare us for the affliction that's going to come. Notice how the, the verse ends. For yourselves know, verse 3, that we are appointed thereunto. The, the faith of God in a Christ-rejecting world is appointed to affliction. Now in the Bible, you talk about certain appointments. It is appointed unto man once to die. Hebrews chapter 9. And that's an appointment that you cannot escape. Every man one day is going to stand before God. He's not going to break that appointment. I've broken a few appointments in my life. You may have broken a few too. Sometimes we come up with an excuse. Sometimes we don't even call. Sometimes we just don't show. But it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. That's one appointment nobody's breaking. Now, we understand that when it comes to a lost man. And so, therefore, we plead with them to receive the gospel of Christ because we understand they're headed for an appointment they don't even know is on their calendar. They don't even think about it. I mean, okay, sure, they're going to die one day, but they think they're going to die like a dog, and that's the end of it. And what they don't understand is after this appointment is the judgment. You're going to stand before God. And we're, we're very good at getting this appointment. Uh, uh, we reconcile this quite well, and, and we got it figured out. But here's an appointment God wants us to know about, an appointment that we're not going to escape as Christians. We are appointed to afflictions. Just like the lost man isn't going to escape the judgment of standing before God, he's appointed to it, you, Christian, are appointed to affliction. If you're looking for a, a feel-good Christianity that you're going to go through this uh, world like a skylark just singing and humming, you have to understand these are the afflictions we've been appointed to. We are appointed to afflictions, and you're not going to escape it. Now, here's what a faithful minister will do. He'll tell you about it. He, he's going to tell you this so you won't be moved by it when it comes. So you won't be blindsided. So you won't be knocked over and wallowing on your back, uh, crying and complaining about this affliction. I didn't know this was coming. And, and this is why Paul and Timothy and uh, Silas and all of these men understood these things. And this is in the establishment of a church when we're laying the ground of faith and we're explaining uh, this is the gospel of Christ. Christ himself was a man who was afflicted. He was a man of sorrows. He was a man acquainted with grief. If you're going to be his friend and walk with him, you're going to be painted with the same brush. You're going to be afflicted. You're going to face some grief. You're going to have some sorrow. You're going to get some rejection in your life. That's what's going to happen. Well, I like being popular. I want to be the head cheerleader. I want to be the quarterback. Well, it's not going to be so if you're going to be a faithful minister for Jesus Christ. You're appointed to afflictions. Now, I understand a lot of feel-good Christianity in the last hundred years wants to pull back and wants to escape that appointment. And I got news for them. They can't. 
they can't escape it. And if, and if they don't get it in this lifetime, I can assure you the Lord himself will afflict them. And I can give you a lot of verses in the Bible that God himself will pour out the afflictions and the chastisement upon them. Maybe in the millennium, that's when they're going to get their chance to face some affliction. And the millennium's a heck of a lot longer than 40, 50, 60 years. That's a thousand years. So I'd rather take the short afflictions and enjoy the millennium. But Paul wants you to understand we're appointed to it. So, so the lost man, he's appointed to his affliction. He's appointed to the day he's going to uh, meet God. We're appointed to ours here. I want to so, show you someone else who's appointed to something. Go to Daniel 11. The church is appointed to something, affliction. Daniel 11. And another appointment that's going to be kept by the nation of Israel. And in, and in this chapter, there's a lot of talk here, prophecy that's given about the last days and the Antichrist. In verse 31, it says, And, and the arms shall stand on his part, uh, big armies, the Antichrist, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And this is the Antichrist and his men. And they shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And in the tribulation, the, the Jews that are faithful are going to have to stand against this. Verse 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall. Some of them are going to fight and they're going to, they're going to fall in the battle. It's going to, to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. There's another appointment that's going to be kept. There's the appointment of the trial of the nation Israel, the, the uh, time of Jacob's trouble that they're going to go through. They're appointed to that. That's going to be their time of affliction. So, so here's what God's saying. Look, folks, you can't escape these appointments. And it's folly for Christians to think they can have a happy American dream Christianity. And shame on the teachers that give them that notion. They're not faithful like Paul is. Paul says, I'm trying to establish a church, and one of the things I need to let them know is they're appointed to affliction. And I'd be lying to them if I didn't tell them. If the doctor comes in and he tells you this shot isn't going to hurt, he's lying to you. The shot is going to hurt. It hurts. Now roll up your sleeve, make a fist, look the other way, and grin and bear it. It hurts. No need to lie about it. There's no way I can take a needle and shove it in your arm and it's not going to hurt. I guess I can put you to sleep with an anesthetic. That's folly. It's going to hurt. So be a man and take it. I, I can't understand these. As a doctor, used to frustrate me. Full-grown adults. What you, come on. Be a man. It's a shot. You can take it. It's an affliction. Come on, Christian. Be a Christian. You're appointed to some afflictions. That, that's the way it is. Now, now verse 4, he tells you, For verily, truly, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. I mean, Paul told them how he got there and what he had gone through. And I don't know if uh, Luke had been chronicling the book of Acts and may have said, well, I'm all the way up to chapter 15, now 16 here, read this. But at least by word of mouth, Paul was able to tell these people what it is like. You know what it's like. I know what it's like. Uh, uh, the, the gospel is a good news on one side of the coin. It's bad news on the other side of the coin because I got to tell the people, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. To be all right with God. What about um, you're talking about affliction and stuff? They're talking uh, somebody that's you know loves God and everything. Yes. Uh, their friend says, "Oh, you love God and all that stuff," and then they say, "Oh, no, not like that." They're talking behind God's back. Not like that, right? 
Well, sure. I mean, and one of the ways you do face affliction, like our brother is saying up here, is so often one of the afflictions you face is the affliction of having people who are close to you turn away from you. And and that that, that happens. I had a friend of mine that uh, we had been close for decades. I mean, I was 39 when I got saved, and we had known each other since I was maybe 14, 15 years old. And we were we were kids in high school, and we ran and did everything together for decades. And then when I got saved, that was it. He didn't want to know me anymore. I didn't have to leave him. He left me because of my closeness to Jesus Christ. He left me because of the fact that now what I wanted to do in my free time was not go with him where we used to go. Now I wanted to go to church. Now I wanted to go to Bible conferences. Now I wanted to go out on the streets and pass out tracts. Now I didn't want to go to the places we used to go. He didn't understand that. And part of the affliction is just having people close to you walk away from you and then talk about you behind your back. Yes. And this, this is what goes on. And this is the tribulation we're going to suffer. And that's just uh, emotional, uh, personal friendship tribulation. At the time when these folks lived, when the Roman Empire was, was in complete control and they had a set of laws that allowed them to do many things, uh, they faced serious tribulation and affliction being thrown in jail for their faith, uh, having uh, taking stripes and wounding for the faith. Even some of them are resisting all the way up into blood and dying for their faith and being martyred. The tribulations and the afflictions. And Paul says, uh, you know, one of the ways we're going to establish you is we're going to have faithful ministers that are going to tell you about this Thing. We're going to tell you honestly, we're not going to candy coat it. We're not going to soft soap it. We're not going to put a, a, a pretty face on it. I mean, it's wonderful to be saved, but you have to understand the world hates it. And, and, a, and a false balance is abomination to the Lord. If all we do is talk about one side and not talk about the afflictions and the persecutions and the tribulations, that's not good ministry. So Paul says, we're going to establish this church by telling them the truth. We're going to send ministers that have actually lived through the afflictions and tribulations that can give you firsthand testimony and prepare you for it and gird up your loins in preparation for it. That's how you establish a strong church that witnesses the gospel of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're going to have a little social club that nobody knows about on the streets. People should know about your church church because it preaches the gospel and it passes out literature and uh, people find it everywhere oh look another one of these oh from that church over there oh another one of these gospel tracts from that church over there oh another booklet from that church over there oh another invitation from that church over there all they do is talk about jesus christ in the bible that's all they do yes because that's what a faithful laborer in the gospel of christ does talks about jesus christ in the gospel it seems like a one-trick pony. Yeah, it's a white horse that the one's riding on going to take you to heaven. That, that's what we major on. And, and we don't like to major on the minors. And churches can get off the beaten path doing that. So Paul says, this is how I'm going to establish the church. We're going to send ministers that, that tell you the truth. Verse 5, and for this cause, when, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Uh, Paul had to leave. Paul's job was an apostle, uh, like a missionary that went from region to region and established churches. But, but he wanted to know how was this church doing that I had uh, nurtured for 6 or 12 or 18 months. How is it doing? So he sends someone back. He says to know your faith. And that's what he wants to know. How is their faith doing? Not, not how many numbers are in the building. Not what the budget is at the building. And that's, not, that's, the main, that's not my main concern. My main concern is how is the faith of the individuals doing in the building? I say, is your church growing in faith, in grace, in knowledge? What about numbers? I, I don't keep numbers. I really don't. I mean, I've been to conference after conference. How many people do you run? I don't know. I don't know. Let's have a race. We'll count. I don't know. I don't know how many people. 
It, it, it's not my concern. My concern is making sure that we're fed. Uh, and I say our people are growing in faith. One of the evidences I have of that is they give out the gospel. And that's what Paul wanted to know. Are you still giving out the gospel in light of all the persecution you're facing? Uh, he said, or is the tempter tempting you saying, you know, if you just be quiet, some of these persecutions, tribulations, and afflictions would really settle down. We can turn the heat down here if you just get quiet. Just keep your mouth shut. Don't talk to your family anymore. Don't send them Christmas cards with tracks in any, anymore. Uh, don't talk to the fellow laborers at the workplace anymore. Just, just, and then he said, that my labor's in vain then. Because the purpose wasn't just to establish a little Christian social club. The purpose was to establish a, a, a church that witnesses for Jesus Christ. And so he said, this is why I wanted to find out. I sent Timothy back to see how are they doing there in terms of their witness. How are they doing in, in face of tribulation? Are they still hanging tough? Are they still standing, doing all they can to stand? And so he says, I sent Timothy. You see, what he's going to do is he's going to use his ministers and he's sending a letter to them. And so how's God going to establish a church? Through men and by the word. The word of God plus the men of God are going to be used to establish the local church. Why? Because the tempter has only one desire to, to reduce your faith. To diminish your faith. If possible, remove your faith, although he can't do that because once you're a child of God, you're a child of God forever. Once you're the Lord's, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He can't take your salvation, but he'd love to take your witness and your testimony away. He'd love to put a bushel over your light. Hopefully that these uh, trials and tribulations will get so much that you'll just put that bushel over there and you won't shine anymore. You just be that little place down on the corner that nobody knows about. That's the tempter. Verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. And here's Paul says, you know, the reality is God's at work in many different places. And you've got a local church here. And Paul's at a local church over there that he's setting up. And and when the communication comes back, has uh, water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. And when you hear that this church is standing, and this church is standing, then it makes us all stand up and cheer together. That's why I like to see that in the Western New York, we have good Bible-believing churches. We have sister churches. I like when we visit them every so often, like we'll be doing this Tuesday night, like we did yesterday, and we get to know one another, and we encourage one another in the gospel. And they say, yeah, we've been, we've been doing some work over here, and we've been facing some affliction in our area. And we get the same thing over here. We get some resistance over here. And we, oh, we're both experiencing the same thing. And we encourage one another, and we stand together, and we keep the gospel going. And he says, Man, we were comforted in our affliction and distress when we heard of the strong faith going on in Thessalonica. And we're, I'm encouraged when I hear about the good work that goes on in Medina and the good work that goes on in Hamburg and the work that goes on in Tanawan. When I hear these things, it encourages me to keep going. There are men that continue to stand against the headwinds of the world, and that makes me want to stand up too. And Paul says he's encouraged by this. He's comforted over this. Yes, affliction and distress. But when I hear of the faith of others, how can I not stand faithful to? And Paul says this is one of the ways God's going to establish churches. As he establishes them individually, they're going to communicate one to another. And we're excited when we hear from Colombia. And we're excited when we hear from Africa. And we hear from the Philippines. And we hear about our sister churches there. That is encourages us that comforts us that keeps us standing that keeps us marching 
And Paul says, verse 8, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Now, now he's using live, I'm going to think like Jesus used it in the Gospel of John. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And what he's saying is that's the abundant life. The abundant life really comes when people are standing fast in the Lord. I mean, you can have life, but not more abundantly. And I, I'm, I'm certain that's what he's referring to. He's not just talking about the basic born-again experience. He's talking about the life of a soldier of Jesus Christ. That's a different kind of life. Uh, military life is different than civilian life. It's two different things. Now, now most of us in America, uh, and I don't think it's correct, I think America should do like Israel and make everyone graduate high school, spend at least one year in the military. I think that would be good for, for, for the nation at, whole, at large for many, many, many different reasons. I think, I think first off, it's just good for young kids to get some discipline. I think it's good for young kids to, to be in a structure where there is discipline and a hierarchy of rank and learn respect for officers and things like that. I think it's also good for young ones to learn to be skilled in, in battle techniques and to know how to shoot a gun. I think it would be good if every man in this country had spent some time learning how to properly handle a gun, how to clean it, how to, how to load it, how to aim it, how to fire it, how to do all that properly. I think if you had a nation full of men like that, some other nation think 50 times before they want to cross the borders and give you any trouble. I think that's good for a lot of reasons, but nonetheless, you're going to see there's a difference between a military person and a civilian person. A civilian person done none of that stuff. Civilian person, uh, I, I've gone my whole life, and I've a couple times handled guns, a few times been to a shooting range, not much. And if it weren't for my few friends that had taken me, I never would have done it. And so I'm just this lazy, inept civilian, good for nothing in a battle. Well, nobody needs a nation full of bums like that. We certainly don't need a church like that. Now, now, for me defending the United States, that's one thing. For me pledging allegiance to the flag, that's one thing. It's all physical. It's temporal. It'll end with my life. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, you're talking about eternity. And there you don't want to be a civilian Christian. And God set it up so that you can know how to handle the sword of the Spirit. And you can put on the armor of God. And you can live that Christian abundant life where you're serving Jesus Christ and Paul says this is when we really have that life when people are standing fast in the Lord that's the abundant life and sadly I think what happened to America physically and that most Americans are just civilians and never been anything but a civilian same things happened to the church and most of the American church is both mostly civilian Christians who've never stood up for the Lord and they don't have abundant life and you don't hear the testimony. And, and I've had the opportunity in my life to run in both uh, circles of churches because the first church I was saved in was a nice NIV, whoop de doo happy, happy uh, Christian country club type of church. And I got to spend time with those other churches. And uh, the battle wasn't what they talked about. What they talked about, if they talked about battle, it was splat ball. Or, or other things that were going on, or, or, or some banquet or something like that, and the fight we had over which color tablecloth we were going to pick out. And those are the type of battles. But, but it wasn't standing for the Lord. What a difference when I got into churches that hold the Word of God, that would be the King James Bible in English, and do make an attempt to pass out tracts. Uh, what a difference. And, and, and you get real life when you see people standing fast in the Lord. It's a great testimony. So, so how does God establish a church? He's going to take that word. He's going to work that word in some individuals. And he's going to circulate those individuals to reproduce after their kind. To get a new work going where people can have the abundant life. Verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Here's going to be the third thing he's going to do. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now notice, faith is a big word we've been seeing through here. Because the faith is the real concern. 
how is your faith doing? And he's going to say, uh, how is a faith going to be built up? Well, it's going to be established upon the gospel of Christ. It's going to have some men that are ministers of that gospel. They're going to carry that word and they're going to pray. Verse 10. How do you strengthen someone's faith? You take ministers that tell you the truth with the Bible and then they pray for you. And that's how it's going to be done. Those are going to be the basic ingredients to building a strong church. I need the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need the word of God. I need some men of God who've served. And then I, I need some prayer. And you put all that together and you're going to have a strong, established church. And that's what Paul is, is writing this chapter about the establishment to establish unblameable hearts before God. That's what he's trying to do. And he's going to do it through the work at the local church with the men of God, the word of God and prayer. And that's what he's going to do night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face. One of the things we do is we pray for one another. We have our Thursday night prayer meetings and we get together and we pray. And maybe we need to pray more for each other. I know we pray for lost people to get saved. I know we pray for our sister churches. I know we pray for our missionaries. And sometimes we take a prayer for us. But maybe we can individualize it. And if one of the ladies wants to take names and divide them up into groups of six or eight, we could have little prayer groups and people praying for each other might be hard to pray for a lot of people, but if you've got a small group with six, it's easy to pray for five other people in that group. And praying one for another, that faith would be deepened, strengthened, established. And Paul says that's what we were doing. The man of God with the word of God, the ministers of God, praying for the people of God to build up that which might be lacking in someone's faith. I mean, nobody's going to have a perfectly balanced faith. There's going to be weakness. I got weaknesses in my faith. You have some weaknesses in your faith. Now, together, probably God's put us together that we have all the parts we need here. But maybe you could pray for my weakness. I could pray for yours. Not weakness in my sin life, weakness in my faith. I don't particularly want to know your sins, and I don't want you to know mine. But I can tell you areas where I struggle in my faith. And that's where we need some prayer. And so Paul says, this is how we're going to do this. And then he closes the chapter and he says, um, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And of course, what he was historically, he wanted to get back to this church. And and what God would say for us is uh, he would pray, God himself and our, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way back onto our church and make sure that we get back here where we can continue to regather and pray for one another's faith and minister the, God, uh, the word of God one to another and exchange uh, uh, war stories about how we've been out there and what happened to me at the workplace and what happened to you with one of your family members and back and forth and back and forth. The important thing is that of fellowship and seeing one another. Paul realized that it's important for us to get together. Not so much to talk about our job, not so much to talk about the new car, not so much to talk about the flat screen TV, but to talk about what we're doing in the gospel and in our faith, because that's what needs strengthening. Although my TV could use a little tuning up, but that's another issue. The more important thing is our faith needs a tune up. And so that's why he says we get back together, we make our way unto you. And he says in verse 12, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Now notice, love, that's the charity. He had just mentioned a few uh, verses back in verse 6. He talked about faith and charity. Charity is the labor of love, loving one another. Now, the greatest love, of course, God, you know, giving Jesus Christ, that's the great love of salvation. But the greatest love we have one for another is that we are built up in Christ. And so that notice, notice the order he says right here. He says, uh, verse 12, Lord, make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, comma, and toward all men. Now, my love toward all men is to give them the gospel. But our love in here 
is to build us up and nurture us up as members of God's family. There is a hierarchy and a priority to love. Well, you know, God loves unconditionally. I don't know about that. I think he's got a priority to his love list. I bet his son's at the top of it. And then his, the church and the Jews are, are coming right after that. And then his love for the world is beneath that. And yes, he wants to see the, the world, uh, people get saved out of the world and, and moved into his church. But his heart is here. His heart is in the nation Israel. His heart is toward his people. And that's where our heart ought to be too. Toward the building of this, the body of Christ. Now, I also want to love the world. I, I want to make them, get them in and be a part of it. But if they don't want to be a part of it, I don't particularly love what they want to do and I don't want to further what they're trying to do. I don't want to get on their bandwagon doing what they want to do. Because what they want to do is contrary. As a matter of fact, what they want to do may be afflict the church. And I don't want any part of that. Our, our love has to abound one toward another. And then we love out there too to help people get saved. And then he says, uh, verse 13, God and Jesus working and building up into you, verse 13, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, now here's something he can do. He say, I can't be perfect. You might not uh, be perfect, but you can be unblameable before God. You can be unblameable without being perfect. When you're, we'll look at it like children. If you're training, working with a child and asking them to do a task, like right now, let's say it's Christmas time, and let's say you're going to have some members of your family over for Christmas dinner, and one of the children says, you know, I'd like to help you prepare. You say, okay, set the table. And they go and they set the table and then you come in and you look and the fork is on the wrong side and the napkin is at the bottom of the plate and all that. I mean, they did all kinds of things wrong. But you know what? They're unblameable. They tried to do what you asked them to do and they did it to the best of their ability. It wasn't perfect, but it was unblameable. And that's how God looks at us. He, he Notice it's talking about the heart. Verse 13, that he may establish your heart unblameable. Your works may not be perfect. The things you say may not be, oh, gee, you know, I wish I could have said something better to that guy, witness to him. Yeah, but your heart was in the witness. It's unblameable before God what you did. It's unblameable in holiness. Because if you're trying to give someone the holy child of God, you're trying to give the gospel to someone. If your heart is trying to love somebody, even if they don't see it as love and it doesn't come off perfectly, God says that's holy and that's unblameable in my sight and it's unreprovable. God sees a little differently than we see. Thank goodness. Go, go back to uh, Philippians chapter 2. We're too hard on ourselves. Sometimes we're too hard one another on one another. Philippians chapter 2. I mean, at the end of verse 12, he talks about you and uh, me both trying to work out our salvation. And um, he says in verse 13, It is God which worketh in you to do uh, both to do his will and of his good pleasure. I mean, God's good pleasure is to get people saved. God's good pleasure is to have that gospel uh, circulated. God's good pleasure is to have that thing inside your heart come out your mouth and out in your life. So he says, this is how you do it. A verse, verse 14, do all things without murmuring and disputing. When you ask that little child to set the table, if they went in with good cheer and they set it, that's fine. But if they went in and, blah, I don't want to do this. What the heck am I setting tables for? Don't you know who I am? I could be watching TV and stuff like that. Uh, look at the next verse. That ye may be blameless. You see, the heart is the matter. It's, it's the heart of the matter. 
if you're murmuring and griping and complaining and I don't want to do this and there's afflictions and there's trials and tribulation, I just want to sit in the easy chair and kick back. And God says, that's, then that's blamable to me. But if you get out there and you do what the Lord would have you to do and you let him work and to do his pleasure through you and you do it without murmuring and disputing, you're blameless. You're harmless. You're, you're the son of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation in whom you shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. When we go out there, an established church, I mean, he started with the establishment of the church, but he looked particularly to the individuals within the church and said, what we're doing, the way you establish a church, you establish hearts. And when you establish the heart right, then the church can be just fine. And God wants to work in your hearts. And that's why the man of God, the minister, Timothy, Paul, Silvanus, bringing the word of God. Today, you and me, it's a King James Bible. Taking some prayer of God putting that all together, that should establish hearts. Hearts that learn to hold forth the light and shine. Hearts that, that work without uh, murmuring and disputing. Hearts that are blameless and established now unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Every chapter he talks about the second coming. The one last thing that's needed to have a strong church is teaching on the second coming. That's absolutely vital. You've got the minister, you've got the word, you've got the prayer, and you've got to have the truth of the second coming. You can't put the coming of our Lord aside. That is so important. The second coming. We talk about it a lot here. Now, we're living close to it. I was going to do a study, but, but uh, so many things going on, on uh, the, the, both the first and the second coming of the Lord, because all of history revolves around Jesus Christ. All of human history revolves around it. And at the first coming of the Lord, if you ever study the Old Testament scriptures, and it's particularly Daniel, and we've done it once or twice, that thing nails down right to the very day that Christ would march in, will actually ride into Jerusalem on, on the little foal. The, how's that thing go? Yeah, the, the little colt, you know. And he, he rides in there. And that thing was come right down to the day. But nobody quite fully understood how old he would be when that happened. So there was a few decades of like, well, when is exactly is he going to come? When's he going to be born? There was a few decades of confusion. Now it ended up, he wrote it in 33. So it was 33 years earlier when the birth occurred. And you couldn't quite figure it out from that prophecy. There was that few decades of, I don't know. It's the same with the second coming. I mean, we know he told us it'd be two days. But there's that few decades of confusion in here. Everybody expected it 2000. It didn't happen. But now we're getting a few decades after 2000 and it's getting real close. And so it's inconceivable to me when I hear Christian teachers on the radio, on television, in their churches say foolish. And, and I know we get caught up in our culture and most of them are American teachers and they talk about America and they look about, well, in 50 years or 60 years from how could you honestly think America will be around 50 or 60 years from now? In, in a real church, the, the talking of the second coming of the Lord, the preaching, the teaching, the discussion of it should be paramount. And here in every chapter, Paul ends with the second coming of the Lord. Now, in this particular verse, I'll just notice how it's worded. It says, um, even our Father, before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And a lot of people say, uh, well, that's when he, he comes back from heaven uh, with uh, the saints to, uh, for the rapture. And, and I think partially that is it. I mean, that's partially it. I mean, Revelation 19, I saw heaven open and a white horse and him that sat on it called faithful and true and behind him the armies of heaven came. And here he comes with his saints coming back. 
Now, but I also think verse 13 is a, is a reference to when we actually get to go before the uh, Father, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What, what's going to happen one day is God the Father sitting on the throne is going to be sitting and waiting, and one day his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to approach that throne with all his saints, and he's going to introduce us to the Father. And at that introduction, I can assure you, your hearts are going to be unblameable in holiness, because without holiness, no man shall see God. So, so what I see in that reference going even deeper, plumbing that a little bit deeper, is the fact that Jesus Christ got a lot of work to do with us, getting us ready. Because my heart isn't exactly unblameable in holiness at this point. <laughs> so I see before he's going to be able to bring me before his father, he's got some work to do. And if he doesn't get it done in this lifetime, he'll get it done in the millennium. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is about Jesus Christ. And it doesn't end at Calvary. That's where it begins. There's much more to it. And we need to be excited about that. And we need to be looking forward to that second coming. When he comes, he gets ready. And he begins to work with us to establish our hearts unblameable in holiness so he can bring us before the Father. And that's why it's so important for us always to talk about our gathering unto the Lord. Churches that don't do that are kind of half dead. Prophecy is important, but it's the prophecy of the coming of the Lord. All right, finish that chapter. Any questions on that? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you uh, to talk again about the gospel and the second coming. And this is a week, uh, Christmas time, where the people of the world are, if you will, celebrating sort of your first coming. I don't know, sometimes I think they're just celebrating gifts. But help us, Lord, to focus their eyes on what Christmas is about, that Jesus Christ is not just the reason for the season, he is the Savior and the Redeemer, and he has the gospel. And even if we face a little affliction doing it, Lord, help us to stand fast in the faith, keep our hearts unblameable in holiness as we give this witness, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.